I'm an entrepreneur, originally from South Africa, and I moved to Paris uh, a few years ago to build a platform or an event to bring all the actors and players of new mobility together um, with a focus on how do we move around cities in a way that does not congest, does not pollute, and does not make noise. Um, just before we start, let me try to get a, a, a sort of sense of, of the audience. Who here does not own a motor car, does not use a motor car for mobility? So, so very few. Um, who of you work for government? Policy makers, okay. Who of you are entrepreneurs? Who are you from the motor industry? Who of you work for the public transport industry? Okay, so, so that's a great, great kind of mix. So you, at the moment, the vast majority are using your motor cars for transport um, with a mix of, of private sector, public sector. Okay, so let's, um, let, let's start. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you a little bit about Autonomy, my event, about what we believe is the right way for cities to create their mobility, and the reference city we're going to use is Paris, because that's a city we understand and that's where we're based. So, so Paris is not, like, uh, not that different to any other major city in Europe. It has what we call very good multi-mobility. You can cycle, you can walk, public transport, um, and, and obviously motor car traffic. And despite that, it has a massive pollution problem. Um, the, 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 since Dieselgate, when Volkswagen got caught for cheating with the um, emissions, suddenly cities are starting to measure the pollution levels from nitrous oxide. Um, there was a recently an article in Nature magazine saying that there are 33,000 premature deaths in the world from diesel pollution, um, from vehicles and, and uh, diesel vehicles, and which 20,000 odd are in Europe. So suddenly Europe is faced with this massive diesel problem because the majority of cars in Europe are diesel. Um, since 1997, when the EU decided that diesel was a good fuel to reduce carbon emissions, which was obviously a result of lobbying. So Europe is now in a very strong position to change its mobility away from diesel. How do you get the right mobility in a city? What you'll start hearing now, your policymakers, and what you'll start seeing is different companies, different policymakers coming up with a different mix of how you should have perfect mobility in a city. We work a lot with um, the Marie de Paris, we work a lot with the railway station, SNCF, we work a lot with uh, car companies, shared mobility companies, um, you know, companies like Free to Move or Car to Go or PSA um, is Free to Move. And what we, what we believe at Autonomy is that to have the best mobility in cities, you need to have a combination of active mobility, understand data, and then when you go to vehicles, they should be autonomous, shared, and electric. So I'll run through each of those, but we believe that that will give you the best mix of mobility. So active mobility is effectively using your own energy to get from A to B, mainly walking and cycling are, are the obvious ones. Within that, you start getting a lot of these funny new devices, um, little kick scooters, solar wheels. Um, we call that micro-mobility or last mile solutions. And I believe that active mobility is the single most important mobility for European cities. And the reason why I believe that is that it gives you the highest density of mobility. If you can encourage people to walk and cycle, you can move more people in a small area than you can with any other form of mobility. I'm sure all of you have been to Venice and see how many people move around Venice with active mobility. Because it's Venice, there's no alternative but active mobility. And there are probably as many people moving around Venice with a tiny infrastructure than there are in the whole of Los Angeles with a massive infrastructure. Um, the other reason why active mobility is so important for European cities is that active mobility drives cash directly into the local economy. When you are walking the streets, you are spending money shopping, buying beers, coffees, in supporting the local bakery, butchery, etc., etc. The big problem that European cities face, like elsewhere in the world, is that the car culture, the shopping mall culture, the Amazon culture is driving the economy into a digital platform, is driving the economy into supermarkets outside of cities, and is killing that sense of place in a city. So for policymakers, it's very important to keep pushing active mobility. And there are ways to do that. The way that Paris is doing it, which has worked, is they reduce the number of parking bays in a city. So they have, since 2001, eliminated 100,000 parking bays. There are 150,000 parking bays left. And what that means now is there's more space for, for walking and cycling, and there is more of a motivation to do it. In Paris still today, with 140,000 
parking bays, the average Parisian spends 5% of their car's life driving their car. Of that time that they drive their car, they spend 30% looking for a parking bay. So a third of their car mobility is spent looking for a parking bay. The city of Paris has decided to increase the price of parking for motor cars by 100% in January 2018. And what you will see is cities will continually put in policies and legislation to push out single car ownership. So, so that is active mobility. So data is a way that cities can really start making the right decisions to put in the right infrastructure for mobility. There's some massive players who are really starting to understand data in, in terms of transport. IBM are one of the leaders. They have um, predictive data analytics that will tell you where the ambulance should be waiting on the corner for the accident to happen because their data analytics predict an accident because of the weather, because of the flows of traffic and say, ambulance, wait here, an accident will happen within the next five minutes. They also use their um, predictive data analytics to work out where bicycles should be positioned at which bicycle stations on the flow of demand. So it's very important that cities encourage the transport operators to open up their APIs, that cities encourage the likes of Uber to open up their ABIs, the tax APIs, the taxi services, because cities have a huge amount of data from the different transport operators. And how do you manage that data and start working out the demand, the flow, um, without putting an infrastructure that you don't actually know there is that demand for it. Um, it's good to have Brian here from Strava. Strava has the most data on active mobility. Very important if you want to build cycle lanes. How do you know where people are cycling, where they're most likely to cycle? Data is the answer for that. Then, So then, then autonomous mobility. So this is the, the space that gets the most interest. It's the most sexy subject, autonomous vehicles. Everybody's obviously seen in the last year the amount of press they get and the amount of talk about autonomous vehicles. The truth is that autonomous vehicles are here, they work, and they will be part of our lives within the next five or ten years. In Paris, there's already an autonomous shuttle um, done by RATP. It's in test phase, it's working on the streets of Paris as we speak. And what you're gonna see with autonomous vehicles is you're gonna see two big possibilities happening. The first is you're gonna see competition coming from the car companies versus the tech companies. So the Ubers of the world and the Baidus of the world and the Googles of the world want to make autonomous vehicles where humans can't drive them. They are merely robo-taxis. They take you with a, with, a, with a push of a smartphone button, they collect you, you don't have the ability to drive them. You sit in the back, watch a Netflix movie, and they take you from A to B. So that's the vision of the likes of Google or Baidu or Uber. The other vision is the car vision, which the likes of Tesla, BMW, Ford, etc., are building. And that is driverless or driver-assisted or driver-driven. And what they are hoping is that the human, the driver, will still have a relationship with a motor car that there still is this desire to own and buy a motor car, but you as a driver can decide to drive it when you want, and when you don't want to drive it, it will drive you. And it's very important as policymakers to understand these two very different visions, because the, the, the difficulty with mobility is that the single most valuable resource at the moment is space in cities. The urban population will basically double in 20 years' time, so twice as many people will live, live in cities in 20 years' time. And the single most valuable asset will be space. So how do you accommodate everybody to own an autonomous vehicle? The price of autonomous vehicles in 10, 15, 20 years' time will not be expensive at all. Um, we have clients in China who in five years are able to build a factory, build a prototype, and go into production with electric vehicles with autonomous capabilities um, in an incredibly fast time period. So you'll suddenly start seeing a huge amount of autonomous vehicles available for consumers. Is there the space for cities to have everybody owning an autonomous vehicle? If I own an autonomous vehicle and I don't want to park it, I can tell my autonomous vehicle to drive around and around while I have a slow lunch because I don't want to pay for parking. The problem now is, is that if three or 4,000 other people in Paris decide the same thing, you're going to have a lot of congestion with empty vehicles not moving people. So that brings autonomous vehicles onto the next big question is that 
will autonomous vehicles be run by public transport operators like the RATPs of the world or will they be private individually owned looking after our needs and as policymakers, that's something you're going to be faced with lobbied with by the car industry by the, by the big tech and data companies um, obviously autonomous vehicles have a massive contribution to play in terms of reducing the number of deaths from car accidents that's roughly 1.2 million a year around uh, uh, deaths around the world a year and obviously the big downside for autonomous vehicles something that policymakers again are going to have to work with is the amount of jobs autonomous vehicles will replace america has two million truck drivers um, it has a million taxi drivers europe has a huge amount of drivers too and slowly drivers will start being displaced by autonomous vehicles and obviously people need to start reskilling finding new ways of how to deal with disruption that autonomous vehicles will do mainly to to male blue collar jobs so shared mobility is, is now a very hot and sexy way of getting a great mobility solution in a city very quickly shared mobility we all understand and have seen bike sharing it's been around for quite a while now it's um, done quite well in cities um, and suddenly we now see two companies in china one called mobike other one called ofo that are doing bike sharing on a completely disruptive scale. What Mobike would do if they went into a city like Lisbon is they would release 100,000 bicycles within a week on your streets with no docking stations, with a simple lock at the back. And they release so many bicycles onto the streets that you're never more than a few meters away from a bicycle. It gives you great mobility at a very low price, but it completely destroys the demand for bicycles. It destroys the other existing bicycle um, share system you have with the docking stations. Um, another uh, very popular shared mobility system that's coming up now is the electric scooters. If you want to bring in a very good system that does sort of 0 to 10 kilometers at a very low cost, that's very quiet, electric scooter share is a great way to go. In Paris, there's a company called City Scoot. Um, they've been there now for a year. They have a thousand vehicles, highly successful, so successful that Another two companies are opening in Paris in the next few months with scooter sharing. One is Bosch, the big German uh, automotive company, with a company called Coupe, and another is from China, a company called New. So suddenly, you'll sit, you, uh, policymakers and mayors, you'll start being approached by scooter sharing companies with a free floating system. The scooters get left on the street, the scooter sharing company takes the batteries out, push, puts fresh batteries in, and your urbanites are able to get a very inexpensive, very quick, very quiet ride around a city. It's a highly effective way. Um, obviously, car sharing has become a huge thing too. Car sharing has the ability to massively reduce the demand for parking. It has the ability to, to give people excellent mobility without the cost of motor cars. And I, I believe that what we'll start seeing quite soon is cities that will have bike share, scooter share, car share, and a range of different vehicles at very affordable prices with one payment gateway, with one, um, with one company managing the payments. And that will start giving urbanites huge mobility solutions and flexibility without the cost and the downsides of car ownership. Electric mobility is gonna be the big game changer. What's really happening in Europe is that because of diesel pollution, uh, Europe has 29 million dirty diesel motor cars in Europe and the policymakers have decided that they're going to put in legislation to ban diesel in London, Madrid, Paris from 2020 to 2025 to 27 different cities at different times. But you'll suddenly see a huge change in the way we move in cities. When we ban diesel motor cars, what we will see is that consumers won't just replace them with petrol cars because they'll be worried that those will be banned next. So consumers will start questioning whether they should replace their car at all, rather go shared mobility. They'll start questioning how they can get around without having the ownership model. So suddenly Europe will move very quickly to electric um, mobility. Obviously with carbon emissions, with, with pollution, the transition to sustainable mobility with electric as the source of energy is, is, is hugely important. Um, the impacts on urbanites' life to change, obviously the major impacts are reduction in noise, pollution, congestion, and stress. I'm not going to waste your time with talking about how stressful traffic pollution is. Um, we all know. And that's really why policymakers 
are starting to understand that politically they have to change mobility. So I'm just going to give you an example of what autonomy is doing with SNCF. SNCF is a main railway company in France. They have 3,000 stations around the country. They move 3.2 million people per day. Um, and they have a station in the, in the middle of Paris called Gare de l'Est. That is it over there. It's right next to Gare de Nord. Gare de l'Est moves 120,000 people a day move through Gare de l'Est, coming mainly from, from, the, from the, west of, um, the west, sorry, the east of France. Um, what they have, uh, SNCF have asked us to do is to try and transition to change Gare de l'Est from a train station to a multi-mobility hub, from a place where you go to catch a train to a place where you might transition from active mobility walking to pick up an electric scooter, or a place where if you're coming in from the country in an electric vehicle, you will go there, charge your electric vehicle, go surface and walk, or you might charge your electric vehicle, go into the station and do some work in a co-sharing space. And what you need to start understanding is that cities will need hubs where mobility people can change from one form of mobility to the other. These nodes where you have lots of power, you have space, you can change, possibly showers, so that you're not always locked into the idea that your car gives you mobility because your car can take you from A to B. What we need to try and change the idea is that you must transition, you must be multimodal. Um, and what, why SNC have chose to work with autonomy is that they like the idea of active data and then obviously autonomous shared and electric too. Okay. So th that is our event in October, 19 to 21 October. Um, those are the kind of companies we speak to, so it's a very broad church, it's a very broad platform. We have lots of partnerships with cities and with municipalities. It's no cost for cities to partner with us. I strongly recommend any, any city managers partner with us. We do it online. We show your website, uh, your, 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 your logo. Um, we give you information and content and we invite you to the event. And the focus of the event is to get people on the same platform to collaborate, to change mobility. What you have to do if you want to completely change the way we move is all get on the same platform at meetings like this, events like this, which is fantastic, and start having conversations between car companies, policy makers, transport operators. How can we all interact together to change the way we move? Um, who will you, we meet? We have a combination of professionals, policy makers, and urbanites. And we believe that those three groups are the groups that are going to change the way we move in cities. So finally, thank you very much. Um, I invite you all to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm sure you all use LinkedIn. And if you want to really understand mobility, LinkedIn is the space to, to do it. Um, we also have a LinkedIn group called Urban Mobility Pros. Um, please connect to that group too and share any ideas you have, ask any questions. Um, we're very active on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for your time and I'll be here the, for the rest of the afternoon to, to chat if you want to.